So I'd like to start off by giving a brief overview to the ISN and then highlight some of the uh, projects that we're working on. Let me get the uh, gizmo here. So the basic goals of the ISN to, are to try and dramatically improve the survivability of the soldier by working at and extending the frontiers of nanotechnology through fundamental research and through transitioning with our industry and industry partners. Nanotechnology means a lot more than just being able to make things or study things at small length scales. It turns out that the electronic, phononic, mechanical, magnetic properties of materials actually become size dependent below a uh, critical length scale, which is typically on the order of 500 uh, nanometers. And that's because of quantum size effects. So what that means is that nanotechnology could open up opportunities for new materials, new phenomena, new properties that are unattainable in nature in, in normal circumstances. That doesn't mean you're going to get the property that you're looking for, but it does mean you will get something different than the bulk properties of the material. Now, the ISN is really a three-member team. The uh, site uh, at uh, MIT itself, shown at the top there. In the middle, we have our industry consortium. They help in uh, transitioning. And at the bottom, we have our uh, interactions with our colleagues at the Army uh, Science and Technology Labs. And we have uh, quite a few uh, collaborations going on, but we're always keen on uh, increasing these. And hopefully, after this talk, it might inspire some new collaborations. So what are the, uh, basically, uh, potential impact of all of this team effort for Army applications? Well, it turns out that there are numerous uh, impact areas, but I'm only, given the lack of time, I'm only going to make, uh, highlight six of them. Starting from the top, we have low-cost room temperature night vision and communications uh, in the infrared, uh, autonomous and self-administered medical for faster, uh, far-forward medical treatments, lightweight, flexible, and breathable structural materials for better soldier armor, flexible, lightweight nano coatings for multiple survivability uh, capabilities, multifunctional full-body uh, battle suit to enhance soldier senses of uh, light, heat, and sound, and ultra-sensitive explosives uh, sensors for accurate handheld, robotic, and standoff IED detection. Now, what I'd like to do today is give you uh, an important, uh, an example of an important advance for each one of these areas, as well as uh, interesting, exciting opportunities related to each one of these impact areas. So we're going to start off with uh, low-cost room temperature night vision. And in this regard, what we're going to be working with is nanoparticle uh, systems as low-cost uh, room temperature devices. Nanoparticles have good optical properties, but they also can be processed in a very low-cost, efficient manner using uh, polymer processing approaches. Uh, in the figures uh, on the left, the two figures on the left, you see a, uh, emitters that have been made actually using nanoparticles, and you see a graph of uh, four different emission uh, profiles from about uh, 1,300 nanometers to 1,600 nanometers. The interesting thing about this data is that it doesn't ha occur or it does not obtain using different material systems. You're using the same material system. It's just the size of the dot that relates to what you're getting. And we saw that this morning. Um, uh, Evelyn uh, was also discussing that in, in her work. On the right, there's a, a further example of that. We have absorption versus wavelength. And this is all for uh, lead selenide uh, nanocrystals. By the way, nanocrystals, nanoparticles, and quantum dots are all basically the same term, and I'll be using them uh, interchangeably. So what, in this plot, what we see is at the bottom, basically the peak in the plot gives you the optical activity that you're interested in. At the bottom is for a three nanometer diameter particle of lead selenide, and it's active around 1,100 nanometers. At the top curve, uh, that's a particle with a diameter of 10 nanometers and it's active around 2,200 nanometers. Now this range between 1,100 and 2,200 uh, is actually very well known in the night vision community as a source of light in the night sky that comes from, uh, hydro it's called hydroxyl night glow emission. Now here you're seeing two photographs of the same image using two different cameras. The camera on the left is a silicon CCD camera that can only see below 1,000 nanometers wavelengths. The camera on the right is an indium gallium arsenide uh, camera that can see in the night glow uh, regime. And you can see how much clearer that picture is. The reason it's clear is because there's more light there. These indium gallium arsenide uh, cameras, though, are very expensive. 
uh, I think the cheapest ones that you can find are around $30,000 and they, and they go up from there. So what we'd like to be able to, to do is develop these nanoparticle, these quantum dot based uh, optoelectronic devices that could be at much reduced lower cost so that we could provide this kind of ability to the soldier. And to do this, we're involved in a uh, very synergistic uh, collaboration with a variety of groups, as you can see there. If you look at the top, starting on the left, we have ISN, uh, and then we go to SED, uh, this is ARL SED, and then Night Vision Lab, and then Raytheon, one of our uh, industry partners. And the whole effort here, I'm just going to go very quickly here, but the whole effort is to come up with um, a nanocrystal-based IR imager. We're not there yet, but we're very close, and I'm hoping in a year or so to be able to actually have a prototype device that we can begin uh, to play around with. Now, the second impact area involves battlesuit medicine, and we have a variety of projects involved in both uh, monitoring uh, drugs as well as drug delivery. But I'm only going to show you one example for each case. We're going to start off with uh, medical diagnostics and uh, toxic sensing. And what we're going to do here is we're going to use uh, constructs made out of quantum dots and dyes as environmental informers or reporters of what's going around in the environment of the, of the medium that they're in. Now, dyes are certainly very well known as a way of you know, knowing what's there and what's not there. But they're not very good in a quantitative sort of way. The beauty of these uh, constructs here is that you're not getting an intensity which can be, you know, depend a lot on the environment that you're in or what you're exciting it with, et cetera. You're getting actually two different signals, one from the quantum dot and one from the die, and it's the ratio of those signals that's giving you information about what is in that environment. That can be very quantitative. Here's an example of a quantum dot uh, die system used to detect uh, the pH locally in the environment of the dot. In the top curves that you can see there on the right, you see uh, different spectral line shapes associated with different environments from a pH of 6, I don't know if you can read it way back there, but pH of 6 to pH of 10. The key thing here is that you get different line shapes for different pH. And those line shapes are robust. For example, look at the uh, spectrum at the bottom. What you see here as examples for pH 6 and pH 10, and there are actually three curves involved in each case. Each one of those curves corresponds to a different, uh, uh, basically, environmental uh, um, uh, situation. In one case, you have strong excitation of the system. In the other case, you have weak excitation of the system. In the other case, you have a turbid environment. And in all of these three, all the curves line up. So the shape is independent of these things, and that's what makes it uh, a quantitative, and this is work that we're engaged with, with uh, Ashok uh, Kumar from the Corps of Engineers, and we're looking for a lot more uh, collaborators, if anyone is interested. I think there's a lot that can be done with this type of system. In terms of drug delivery, again, we have a variety of different approaches. I'm just going to show you one. This is based on uh, providing autonomous and or self-injected drug delivery through implantable and otherwise MEMS-based uh, devices. And if you look at the bottom there on the left, you see three different uh, embodiments. One could be auto-injection, wearable device in green for uh, auto or remote uh, actuation. At the bottom, we have implantable subcutaneous uh, devices. Now, in all of these uh, devices, we began looking at them with, uh, you know, with drugs in a liquid state. But working with drugs in a liquid state is not optimal because the, you know, the stability of these drugs is, is, is very non-optimal. What you'd really like to be able to do, especially in hot environments, for example, what you'd really like to be able to do is work with lyophilized powder. But if you work with lyophilized powder in drugs, then you really want to be able to develop a rapid reconstitution approach to get that dry powder into a liquid form that you, then, that you can uh, administer. So here on the right side, you see a device on the top figure on the right, which is five, uh, you see the scale five millimeters in size, so it's a tiny device, and it's been designed to do just that. This is very recent work, this is unpublished work. It only takes a couple of seconds, if you look at the bottom, for that dry powder to uh, become uh, liquid. 
So there's, again, this is just the, the first step in trying to do this. I think it's very promising for a variety uh, of different drugs and systems. Also, at the end of my talk, I'm going to very briefly describe a novel um, wireless non-radiative power uh, transfer uh, mechanism that can be you know, used to power these types of devices as well as a, a variety of other systems. The third uh, uh, impact area that I was going to talk about involves uh, making better armor uh, for the soldier. Again, we have a variety of projects here. I'm only going to show you two. The first one has to do with, if you look on the bottom left side of the figure, uh, the figure in the bottom left is a micro truss. We know that trusses can be made to be very strong and light, you know, trusses and bridges and other kinds of things. Now we're talking about micro trusses. As you can see in that picture there, the length scale, I'm not sure you can see, but it's on the order of 500 nanometers between, you know, distance between holes, for instance. The beauty of this particular system is that it, it's uh, flexible, and because it's at the nanoscale, the mechanical properties are very different than its bulk properties. This system can actually, you can stretch it, you can have a strain at least approaching two orders of magnitude greater than the type of strain that you would get in a, a normal bulk material before it, uh, before it breaks. So it has very interesting uh, mechanical properties due to the nanoscale of the system. What we want to do next, and this is a collaboration at Picatinny with Deepak Kapoor, is to take uh, ceramic nanoparticles that, that they make at, uh, at Picatinny and then infiltrate them into this uh, structure to create something which is really bio-inspired, which is layered uh, composites that you can see at the bottom right of this uh, slide, and where you have hard regions surrounded by flexible uh, regions. So where are we at the moment? Well, we've actually done infiltration of the structure, and we're about to start uh, doing uh, the mechanical uh, study. So we'll see how all of this turns out. The second approach that I wanted to mention uh, is only in the planning stages. But the reason I'm going to mention it today is because I think it's so darn cool. It's almost like science fiction. And that is to enable the first carbon nanotube graphene linked flexible chain mail. And uh, if you look at the bottom, it, uh, doing this requires three basic fundamental steps. The figure on the bottom left involves the first step. That is figuring out a way to align individual carbon nanotubes as well as, you know, individual uh, graphene sheets in precisely the right place. Strano thinks he can do that. Actually, he's already demonstrated things along that direction. The second is the one to the right of that, which is then bonding these, doing the chemistry so that you can make the correct bonds between these different structures. That's yet to be done. And above that is the final step, which is taking these layers and creating interlocked structures to create the final uh, uh, structure of chain mail. Again, Strano believes he knows how to do this. In all of this work, it's going to be key to uh, be touching base with atomistic modeling that is actually done at uh, the core with uh, Charlie Marsh and uh, Bob Welsh, as well as mechanical testing that we're going to be doing at WMRD. Now, interestingly, uh, nature actually has beaten us <laughs> to the punch on this in some sense. For example, uh, recently it's become uh, known that for the viral capsid of uh, H97, for instance, uh, contains a very fascinating interlocking structure of proteins, which uh, they are calling actually protein chain mail. And it is known uh, by biologists that this structure is a lot stronger than sort of the fragile individual proteins that uh, make up the structure. And indeed, working in the nanoscale allows us to make much stronger structures, as you can see here. Now, this is a lousy uh, figure just because it got screwed up in the file transfer process. But what you're supposed to be able to see in this figure is tensile strength plotted versus graphene size. And the key is, as you are making graphene size smaller, you see the peak in tensile strength increasing and going you know, to uh, approaching you know, 20 gigapascals or so. Uh, in the figure, I think it reaches about 15, but it can, it'll go up as you go down to uh, less than one micron in size. So this is a very promising uh, type of system. Let me remind you the typical strength of steels 16 uh, gigapascals is about four times the strength of industrial steel. So there's, there's something very exciting if this will uh, actually work. 
The next um, uh, impact area uh, involves being able to uh, perform coatings so that you can have uh, multifunctionality in terms of sensing and protection. And to do this, uh, a very novel technology has been developed by Karen Gleason at MIT. This is unique uh, to the ISN that involves doing chemical vapor deposition with polymers, something that has never been possible before. And the beauty of this uh, approach is that you can do conformal coating. As you can see in the figure on the right, the black rods you can, can represent, say, fibers, and the light blue cylinders are, could be the polymers that coat this fiber in a conformal way, and then you can proceed on functionalizing this. Now, I'm going to give you an example of something very recent. This is a, a great collaboration that we have with Chris Senecal from the Natick uh, Soldier Ardeck. And what you're seeing here on the figure on the left is an uncoated fiber mat that we got from, from uh, Chris. On the right is what you get if you try and coat the system with conducting polymers using, say, a solution or evaporation. You really get crappy uh, material. And here's what happens if you use this special kind of uh, gentle chemical vapor deposition approach. The figure on the right is a coated system. It's beautifully conformally coated. You get a 10 to the 5 increase in conductivity in the system compared to the previous material. So Chris is working on functionalizing this to be able to, de to develop a uh, resistivity-based sensor for pathogens. But there are lots of things that you can do with this type of approach, and we're actually coupled to with a lot of collaborators in different labs. Again, we'd like, if anyone is interested in, in pursuing this in different directions, we'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, I'm just giving you some examples, toxic agents, water repellency, fire retardancy, EMI shielding, and I'm going to give you an example of et cetera. So uh, the et cetera here is performing, uh, using these films to actually make uh, uh, laser eye protection on, on goggles and other kinds of uh, surfaces. As you can see in the figure on the bottom right, uh, you can make these materials in layers. And if you make these materials in layers, you've created basically a Bragg reflector. And that means that you can design this to keep light of a particular frequency out from entering. And so that's the basic idea. At the moment, these things are being tested. And down the road, working with our industry partner, we're going to be doing scale up, et cetera. The next, uh, the fifth impact area involves being able to actually make smart fabrics. To so make smart fabrics, in, on our approach, we want to make smart fibers. What that means is fibers that actually are fiber devices that can be used to create full body sensing uh, on, the, on the battle suit. Uh, in terms of seeing, hearing, and feeling. Again, the technology here is absolutely unique to MIT and to the ISN. And the way it begins is you begin with a preform, as you can see there. By the way, these preforms are on display uh, at our booth at the, uh, at the exhibit. Um, you throw into this preform the stuff of optoelectronics, semiconductors, insulators, uh, metals, and you put them in the right configuration in order to, to be able to make the type of device you want. But the device does not obtain until you melt this structure and draw it into uh, very, very thin fibers, fibers whose outer diameter can be half a millimeter in size or smaller. The figure, the black picture on the right, shows how the topology of the original uh, you know, preform here is preserved in this process. There's a lot of uh, exceptional material science going on here, and this is all due to uh, Yoel Fink uh, at, uh, at MIT. 20 nanometer size uh, feature sizes are possible with the system. At the moment, we've made fibers that can detect light or heat anywhere along the length of the fiber. They create a current that then you can measure. If you can do that, then you can make a mesh out of these fibers, or eventually what we're hoping is a fiber fabric fabric made out of these fibers. But if you can do that, then, for example, you could use, in terms of light detection, you can use this for full, combat, uh, full body combat ID, laser to uniform non-RF uh, communications, as well as, hopefully, improved miles. In terms of thermal sensing, you could use this for remote uh, combat triage, in principle. A soldier is down. They get hit by a round. They're down. They could be you know, unconscious, but information about who the soldier is, the time they went down, the number of injuries, the severity of the injuries can all be done through these kinds of things. Now, we're a long way yet to, to do the uh, combat triage, but I'm going to show you an example now 
of some attempts that we have made recently on doing full combat uh, ID and laser to uniform non-RF uh, communications. But instead of doing the full body, what we've done is only concentrated on a helmet. And this is work that was done in very close collaboration with our friends at, uh, at Natick. Uh, Natick gave us uh, the helmet. They gave us the specs that they wanted. Uh, they gave, uh, Rick Elder gave us his PEC-2 uh, interrogator. On our side, we did the preform, we did the fibers. We, again, means Yoel Fink, uh, and um, created a, a helmet that you can see in the bottom right corner there. That helmet is also on display in our booth at the exhibit, if you're interested. Um, we know that the Army loves acronyms, so we gave an acronym to this helmet. We call it the ICOMH, Identification Communication Multifunctional Helmet. Notice on the upper right of the slide there, uh, there's Fink, there's me, and there's Major uh, Rex Blair. Uh, Blair was a student at the time, and uh, he and the students actually made a movie of how this works. I should also say that this helmet was also tested by SOCOM uh, at Fort Devens. But I'm going to show you a movie now that the students made for how this actually works. Can we turn the lights down, please? Hello, my name is Rex Blair. I'm a major in the United States Army. I've been in the Army for nearly 10 years. I recently returned from deployment with the 1st Cav Division from Iraq. In Iraq, I was a company commander responsible for patrolling southern Baghdad along the Tigris River. I am now at the Institute for Soldiers and Nanotechnology here at MIT, working with Professor Yo Fink's research group. Today, I'll introduce the ICOM-H. ICOM-H stands for Identification and Communication Multifunctional Helmet. During this presentation, we will first discuss the capabilities of the ICOM-H, and then we will demonstrate those capabilities to you. This is the standard Army issue Kevlar that we have modified into the ICOM H. Insert your earpiece, turn it on, and you're ready to go. Here it was we are, snowing that the night, by the Trail way. In Lexington, Massachusetts. We begin by demonstrating the identification capabilities of the ICOM H. As you can see, when we illuminate the ICOM H with an IR designator, the small IR lights on the Kevlar begin to flash. There is an IR light on each side of the Kevlar, so no matter which direction the soldier is facing, he can be identified. This technology is enabled by sensor fibers developed by Professor Yul Fink at MIT. These unique fibers, not much thicker than a fraction of a millimeter, convert light energy into an electronic signal, thus causing the IR light facing the IR designator to flash. The IR light will continue to flash until the designator is moved off the Kevlar thus preventing unwanted IR signatures. Next, we demonstrate the communication capabilities of the ICOM-H. Listen closely as our soldier follows the instructions transmitted to him over the IR designator through the ICOM-H. Stop at that tree. Go to the next tree. So basically what's happening here is you're talking into a laser and that is, you're modulating that signal that's getting picked up by the helmet turned into an audio signal. Now move forward. Yeah. Good. Okay, I think, I think you get the, the basic idea of how this works. Uh, I want to caution you, this isn't something that is ready to give to the troops. There's still a lot of work that we have to do uh, you know, to test it and improve it, etc. But what I want to emphasize in showing this is uh, the ability actually to start from very basic uh, sort of material science principles and move to a prototype device that one can actually begin and test in a field uh, type of environment in a very short time. This was all done in less than a year when we first uh, heard about it. Uh, okay. That's good. We are doing recently a lot of more work in terms of the different kinds of fiber devices that you can make, starting on the left, hollow fibers for high power transmission, optical cavity fibers, a surface emitting laser fibers where the laser light is emitted in transverse direction, thermal detector fibers, and optical detector fibers. I want to mention a couple of things about the hollow fibers. This actually has, this technology has transitioned to the civilian medical community for creating fibers for novel CO2 laser endoscopic surgery. There are, in fact, at the moment, about 175 um, uh, procedures done a week across 250 hospitals in the U.S. using these fibers. So you're really saving lives. And it's a wonderful thing to, to realize that you can go from basic science 
to saving lives in, in a short period of time. Uh, in the future, we're going to be working on fibers for acoustic detection, fo photovoltaic applications, as well as thermoelectric in terms of cooling applications. At the moment, we're working uh, with these fibers for improved FIDO sensing element. And that brings me to the last impact area, which is how do you do um, uh, basically ultra-sensitive IED detection. And this is using, again, we have a variety of efforts along this line using a lot of different techniques. I'm just going to focus on one which is using these amplifying fluorescent polymers. This is a project actually that began as a DARPA project with nomadics, and then was uh, 6162 projects were, uh, were fed into ISN. It has led to the FIDO explosive sensor that many of you may have heard about. It's won uh, Army Science, uh, Army Greatest Invention Awards in 2005, 2006, both for the handheld and robotic uh, type of embodiment. The TSA is actually using a version of this to, to test uh, liquids uh, at the airport environments. And the next step uh, will be to, uh, to develop this thing for multi-analyte detection. And, and this is where the fibers, again, come in. On the, uh, this is work that we're doing with ICX. At the bottom, on the left, the figures on the left, uh, you're seeing a hollow fiber. The hollow fiber cross-section, you can't see it very well in this picture, but it's 100 times smaller than the capillary tube that's typically used as the sensing element in FIDO. Nevertheless, as you can see there, you can get a 15-fold signal enhancement by using these kinds of fibers. Uh, on the right, I show another embodiment where we're using a semiconductor insulator metal type of system to not use amplified fluorescent polymers, but induced fluorescent polymers. Light comes in. Uh, I'm sorry, an analyte comes in. That analyte, presence of the analyte creates light, which then can be detected as an electrical signal. In both of these cases, because the form factor is so small, the idea is to design these fibers for different types of analyte, uh, bundle them uh, together, and hopefully this might lead to the next generation of fibers. On my last slide, I promised to tell you something about wireless non-radiative power transfer. The reason I'm mentioning this is because this has created... It started off in a funny way, uh, and, but it's created a big splash uh, in the field. The way we started this was we knew, you heard about photonic crystals this morning, we knew that photonic crystals can be used to, to control light in very, very novel ways. So we knew that we could, for example, uh, make resonant cavities in photonic crystals in a structure like you see here uh, to any desired frequency, any kind of decay length, and to make it exhibit magnetic behavior even though the material is actually purely dielectric. The reason we want to do this is because we want to work with magnetic fields rather than electric fields. Electric fields are much more harmful to, uh, to living things than magnetic fields. In doing this process, though, we decided, well, you know, these are very complicated structures. Yes, we have wonderful control over how this works, but suppose we try to make a re magnetic resonator in a much more simple way. This, is, this was really on a whim. Suppose we try and there we go, uh, just take the simplest possible thing that you could think of, a loop with a capacitor in it. Clearly, the you know, electric field is concentrated in the capacitor, magnetic field is on side. It's exactly what we want. How well could something like that work in terms of coupling, transferring energy from one uh, resonator to the other? And uh, to make a long story short, we did a theoretical uh, analysis first, predicting what was happening. But we realized the only way to get the people to believe this thing is to actually do an experiment. So we did an experiment, and we saw that, do you know this? I have to tell this joke. You know that um, when you do theory, um, the only person who believes your results is, is the person doing, doing the theory. And when you do experiment, everyone believes your results except you. <laughs> here we had a little bit of, bo of both worlds, did the theory and the experiment. So what you see here are, uh, this is not optimal. It was just uh, you know, some coils. Uh, wrapped together. You see that the distance is two meters. The source and the device are much smaller than the distance between them. And we are able to transfer 60 watts of power. You see a 60 watt light bulb there. And we're able to do this with 50% efficiency. The, the plots uh, in the middle there at the bottom has efficiency versus distance. A theory is in blue. Experiments uh, are, are the dots. And also at the bottom uh, figure, we are all, that's our group, we're all standing there between the source and the device, and notice that we're smiling. So we're feeling pretty good. Uh, no adverse uh, effects. So uh, I think there could be a lot of interesting possible applications for the Army for this. 
again, we're not sure how well we're going to be able to proceed with and how well all this is going to work, but I think it's very promising. And I'm just going to finish up with our signature uh, handshake. Thank you.